such an amazing tribute uh, to uh, a man and a family that uh, I didn't realize uh, until I did the math just a few moments ago that I've been fortunate to know for 18 years now. Uh, back in 2004, when I met uh, Surinder and his wife uh, and family, uh, we didn't know what lay ahead, but everybody was looking forward and knew that whatever had to be done would be done. And it allowed uh, the Puri family to come back together and to have many, many positive years together uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And, and um, as I think all of us who've had uh, families that we've looked after have a significant impact, uh, this family has had a significant impact on me and my career. And I know all of us here feel that same way. These kinds of stories are so important uh, for all of us to understand the impact individuals that we treat have on their, on their world, on their community, and on their family. Um, this is, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the seventh annual Puri Lecture. And um, this was, I think, an absolutely wonderful way to pay tribute uh, to Mr. Puri by his family, to bring our group together around a central, uh, well-known, well-spoken uh, figure in the lymphoma field to help move the field forward so that others can ultimately be cured of this disease with all the research and work that we're doing here, as well as collaborations with many other centers around the world. And we're very fortunate that Dr. LaCase is here today uh, to serve as the speaker in the seventh, uh, in the seventh annual Puri Lecture. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Bloom in just a minute to introduce her. Uh, but I do want to take a moment again to uh, thank the Puri family, uh, particularly um, uh, the immediate family that I've grown to know so well, uh, for all that they've done to support lymphoma work and lymphoma research through this program. Each of the previous six speakers has had a lasting impact on our program and has brought together national uh, and international collaborations that I think are moving the field forward in an incredibly positive way with our folks and our teams at the center of that collaboration. And uh, Dr. LaCase, this is a, it's a big uh, set of shoes to fill, uh, but we look forward to your collaboration with our team here and continuing to grow as we go forward as well. So um, I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Puri to say a few comments. Um, I think um, if anybody knows how to better follow that amazing slide presentation, it's Dr. Puri uh, who can put a lot of this into context. And again, we're very grateful to her and the family for all they've done in support of the lymphoma program at Emory and at Winship uh, and look forward to another outstanding lecture uh, and building towards the future. Dr. Puri. Thank you, Dr. Lonia. Uh, it's always such a hard thing to follow you uh, with your eloquent words, but uh, welcome everybody to 7th uh, Surrender Puri Memorial Lecture. Sir, I'm Mridula Puri, I'm Surrender's wife, and Surrender would have been 84 this year, which is amazing. And uh, this is, uh, I had hoped we would be seeing each other in person, but uh, I, Omicron got in the way, but I'm absolutely determined that next year we will all be together in person and maybe have something to eat before we, uh, we talk. Uh, now, just a little history from uh, what Dr. Loneal has said. Uh, you know, my husband was diagnosed suddenly out of blue in 2004 with stage four mental cell lymphoma. And uh, by grace of God, we got connected with Dr. Loniel and his team at Winship. And my husband got state of the art, quite aggressive treatment, which put him in remission for 10 years so that he was able to enjoy his life, do his work, be with his family, travel, do all the fun things. And uh, then of course the rude awakening that he got, he relapsed after 10 years of remission and we were back in with Dr. Loniel and uh, he was almost in remission again for two years. But one evening, just out of blue again, he uh, was succumbed to fulminate septicemia. We don't know what happened, but uh, anyway, but my, my children and I were of course devastated, but we, we wondered how we could honor his memory and legacy. And uh, I got with Dr. Loniel and with his help, we were able to launch this lecture series. 
And our mission really was to be able to bring all the renowned researchers to Emory, collaborate with Emory researchers and uh, disseminate information. And I am very happy because I feel that we are succeeding in our mission and we have a lot of collaborations going and I hope this continues for years to come. I do want to thank uh, Barbara for putting this together for us and Jennifer, who's also here as my tech support, thank goodness, because I'm quite tech illiterate. Um, now, I uh, want to welcome Dr. Lacaes, um, and I'm very excited because I'm a child psychiatrist and I was excited to know that you treat uh, adolescents and young adults. And I'm very curious what your uh, impression is about the psychological impact of such a devastating illness at such a young age. So I want to thank everybody again and uh, welcome again to the Memorial Lecture. All right, I'll take from here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Christy Bloom and I am pleased to welcome everyone to this lectureship and also wanna echo Dr. Uh, Loniel's words and thank the Perry family for supporting this for the last seven years. It really has led to a lot of collaborations and really wonderful meetings uh, these many years. I'm honored to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Anne LaCase from Dana-Farber and the Harvard Medical School is a renowned lymphoma expert. She has an extensive publication record and NCI funded research in Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with a particular focus on the treatment of these lymphomas in the adolescent and young adult patient population. She is a longstanding member of the Alliance Lymphoma Committee, having shared several large US intergroup trials on both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's that have advanced our treatments in these diseases. She's also the incoming chair of the Lymphoma Research Foundation Scientific Advisory Board and an editor of the American Society of Hematology Annual Education book. Most importantly, Dr. LaCase is a true triple threat with a longstanding dedication to education and mentorship, as well as her clinical care and research responsibilities. She has mentored numerous fellows, residents, and faculty in her roles as the program director for the Dana-Farber Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program, as the chair of the Lymphoma Research Foundation Clinical Research Mentoring Program, and as a member of the ASH Training Committee. She will be speaking to us today on lymphoma in adolescent and young adult patients. Please join me in welcoming Dr. LaCase, who is not only a dear friend, but someone who has truly made a lasting impact in the field of lymphoma research. And I'll let you take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Christy, uh, for the incredibly kind introduction and to the Puri family. It's such an honor to be giving a talk uh, in memory of your husband. Uh, I really enjoyed the slideshow and, and hearing about, about him as a person. Uh, I also, I really appreciate the fact that one of the goals of this uh, talk in this uh, lectureship is to um, forge relationships with the group at Emory, uh, which is truly outstanding uh, and uh, has a number of people I consider close friends, but all of whom I very much uh, admire. So with that, I'll get started. Um, I can make my slides go here. Sorry, there we go. So here are my disclosures, uh, and this is uh, what I'm going to be covering today, talking a little bit at first about uh, lymphoma issues specific to the AYA population, then focusing on uh, two common diseases, Hodgkin being the most common, and then primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. So uh, these are the numbers uh, in terms of incidence of cancers in the adolescent and young adult population, which is typically defined by the NCI as 15 to 30. And you can see in the 15 to 19 year old range, uh, the number of cases is really quite small, but then rapidly increases as uh, the, the population ages. And when you look across these uh, different categories of age, you'll see that the distribution of cancers is quite distinct. And in patients between the ages of 15 and 19, you can see that Hodgkin lymphoma ties for the most common uh, type of cancer that we see with non-Hodgkin lymphoma not far behind. In the 20s, Hodgkin's uh, drops to number uh, four uh, as more, um, you know, 
uh, carcinomas start to emerge, but uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma uh, is uh, slightly behind that. But as we get into the 30s, non-Hodgkin lymphoma drops down and uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, which is a rare disease, falls off the bottom of the list. Um, these are the cancer mortality rates from the mid 70s to 2017. And looking first at males on the left panel, you'll see for Hodgkin lymphoma, death rates have um, continuously decreased, which is uh, obviously very encouraging. When we look at non-Hodgkin lymphoma, there's a very interesting trend. You can see that uh, the mortality rates um, went up surprisingly in the late 80s um, until uh, about 2000 when they started to decrease uh, similarly to the Hodgkin population. And the explanation for this is really related to HIV associated non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, and with the advent, fortunately, of highly active uh, antiretrovirals, uh, we've seen significant improvements in that patient population. And you can see uh, in the right-hand panel, Hodgkin lymphoma here, uh, the death rates uh, in females uh, has also declined steadily uh, since the 70s. The one major issue when treating uh, patients who are adolescent and young adult uh, is thinking about their entire lifespan. So these are individuals that we hope will have many years of productive life ahead of them. So secondary cancers is obviously uh, a major consideration and our, really our greatest fear. And if you look at males um, treated uh, between the uh, ages of 15 and 39, you'll see that secondary cancers uh, are highest in Hodgkin lymphoma, except for soft tissue sarcoma, with observed to expected rates of 2.3. For non-Hodgkin lymphoma, it's the, the rate is about two. And in women, Hodgkin lymphoma is nearly three, with non-Hodgkin lymphoma approaching two. And many of these secondary cancers are related uh, to the use of radiotherapy. So when we think about non-Hodgkin lymphoma specifically in the AYA population, when you look at the age distribution, there's some very interesting trends here. You can see that the indolent lymphomas, oh, sorry about that, follicular lymphoma and malt lymphoma are very uncommon in the uh, early part of that age range, but become more common as time moves on. Burkitt lymphoma is a common disease in the um, in uh, children and AYA population, but then diminishes over time. Lymphoblastic is really a different disease, but has a similar pattern to Burkitt. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common uh, type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma seen in adults. Uh, and there are a number of cases obviously here in the AYA population. And then I'll just point your attention, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma here is a disease also of AYAs, which I won't be discussing today, but fortunately has a very favorable outcome. And we look at this small um, little uh, disease here, primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma is really a disease that is unique to this uh, age population. And we will discuss uh, the biology of this disease and therapeutic options. And this, this data, um, I think, is also very interesting looking at the survival of adolescent and young adult um, cases of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, looking at the various subtypes by age. And as you can see, in general, uh, the younger patients under 15 tend to have very good survival over time. The one uh, notable exception uh, in these graphs is the purple bar, which is primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma, which interestingly, seems to have less of a favorable, favorable prognosis uh, in the youngest group of patients. And why this is, is really not well understood. In addition, Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, which we'll spend uh, the majority of the time talking about, uh, has four different subtypes. As you know, nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte rich and lymphocyte depleted. And you can see the distribution of cases is also different depending upon age with children who are under 15 years of age having um, more mixed cellularity, which typically is associated with Epstein-Barr virus than the adolescent and adult patients. And in the AYA population, the nodular sclerosis subtype is by far and away the most common subtype that we see. 
So what are the, some of the key issues when we're treating patients uh, in this age range? One is obviously the tumor biology. And you know, I think we're still trying to elucidate as to whether these diseases are different in younger uh, patients as they are in older patients. And the more we learn about biology, more subtypes seem to emerge. And I think that we're, we're still in the beginning of uh, understanding these differences host factors in terms of uh, the robustness with which the immune system is working. We, you know, we see mixed cellularity in kids, but not so much uh, in uh, the AYA population. And why is that? I think that's something that we're continuing to work on. Treatment associated late effects is a key, key issue. Uh, and this is something I can't over uh, emphasize enough. We really need to be thinking about the therapies that we're giving today uh, and balancing uh, the risks of late uh, effects that are, you know, can have significant impacts on quality of life. Access to care and adherence is particularly important in AYAs. This is a population of patients who are often moving to various parts of the country or the world as they, um, you know, move out of their primary homes and think about establishing themselves independently. And it's a very, um, I think, a very difficult emotional time to uh, develop cancer when your friends are doing their usual thing and you've got to worry about. Uh, you know, going to get your chemotherapy, adherence to treatments, particularly with oral drugs and, um, you know, complicated regimens can also be a significant barrier in this patient population. And then, uh, you know, over time, um, there's been more collaboration, fortunately, and we'll talk about that a bit uh, between the uh, pediatric oncologist and the adult oncologist to try to harmonize the way we treat these patients. And I think this is really, really important um, to get the best out Outcomes, having all of us work together to think about how to optimize treatment algorithms and clinical trials is critical. So speaking about Hodgkin lymphoma, um, this is probably my favorite disease to treat. Uh, the outcomes are very favorable. It's a rare disease. Uh, there are only about 9,000 new cases a year in the U.S. and fortunately uh, fewer than 1,000 1, deaths. The median age is 39, but as you can see, this is a disease that particularly likes to present in patients in their 20s and 30s. When you look across um, the demographics of patients uh, in the US, and this is data from the SEER registry, you can see that um, this disease is most common in whites, relatively common in blacks and Hispanics, but almost uh, unheard of in Asian uh, and Pacific Islanders or uh, Native Americans. And when we think about uh, where this disease shows up in the demographics, you know, we do see significantly higher rates of Hodgkin lymphoma in the industrialized world. And the nodular sclerosis subtype has been associated with a higher standard of living. There have been multiple hypotheses as to why this may be the case, one of which is uh, this may relate to smaller family size and delayed exposure to common childhood illnesses. There's also been some evidence that uh, the microbiome may play a role. And then in the developing world, the demographics are quite different. Uh, we see uh, the EBV associated subtypes, mixed cellularity and lymphocyte depleted, um, which is almost always associated with Epstein-Barr and particularly with HIV. So the history of Hodgkin lymphoma is really an amazing success story in oncology. In the 1940s, nitrogen mustard was first used to treat patients. And this was based on their recognition during World War I and Barry, Italy, there was an inadvertent bombing where uh, many service people and uh, civilians were exposed to uh, nitrogen mustard. And on autopsy, they were noted to have a plasia of their lymph nodes and bone marrow. And this led to the notion that perhaps that could be um, used to treat uh, using uh, nitrogen mustard to, as a therapeutic option in patients with lymphoma. And this started in the 40s with Gilman and Goodman at Yale, and then Damashek uh, treated patients with Hodgkin's. And then in the 50s, uh, radiotherapy came on the scene and patients were uh, treated with extensive radiotherapy. Then in the 1960s, MOP was developed at the National Cancer Institute, which we'll talk about a little more in a moment. 
Uh, and in 1970, Davida and colleagues at the NCI gave combination chemotherapy with the notion that by giving multiple drugs, you could overcome uh, resistance in the way that uh, tuberculosis had been approached uh, successfully. And I put in this picture of George Canellis, who is at Dana-Farber and still uh, active in our group. And he was part of that original group and has really been a mentor and someone who's had an enormous impact on the field. And then in the 90s, be a cop came along. And then now starting in 2011, more than 10 years ago, our novel targeted agents uh, came on the scene, including brentuximab and the PD-1 inhibitors. So I'm gonna talk about the different therapeutic uh, modalities that we have in Hodgkin, and then I'll talk about how we apply those to patients in various settings. So again, MOP chemotherapy was uh, developed in the 1960s and cured more than half of patients with advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, which was a uh, enormous success story, but it caused infertility um, uh, pretty much across the board, as well as causing stem cell damage, which could, which could lead to myeloid uh, diseases, including AML. ABVD was then introduced in hybrid regimens with ABVD and MOP, or better than MOP, then ABVD really became the standard of care and uh, is still used today in a very effective uh, regimen, which has very low risk of infertility. It does not cause damage to stem cells. Bleomycin can cause pulmonary toxicity, but you know, that is uh, something that we know how to manage. And uh, we now drop bleomycin, uh, as you'll see uh, frequently after two cycles without interfering with efficacy. Then Biocop is, uh, you know, the Germans really uh, deserve a lot of credit for the work that they have done in the field of Hodgkin lymphoma. They do these very large um, randomized studies where the entire country participates uh, from the community physicians to the academic physicians and enrolling patients on trials. And based on the development of growth factors, they were able to intensify chemotherapy uh, to give this escalated Biocop, which is a very uh, active and um, uh, efficacious regimen. However, it, it is uh, somewhat more like MOP and then it causes infertility and has a risk of uh, myeloid uh, damage causing um, MDS. Radiotherapy has also evolved significantly over time. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, patients were always treated with a mantle field, which you can see here. A very large field includes all of the nodal sites above the diaphragm. And there are obviously many important structures included here, including the heart and the axilla and breast tissue in women. Then uh, the, the field moved to using involved field radiotherapy, which still includes fairly extensive radiation fields. Fortunately, now we're using involved site or even involved node if the appropriate imaging has been done prior to radiotherapy to really try to minimize the uh, field of radiation. In addition, over time, the doses of radiation have been diminished and our machinery is much better at targeting the tissue that we want to treat and avoiding uh, the important structures nearby. So along with these advances in therapeutics, the, the understanding of the biology of Hodgkin lymphoma has really accelerated dramatically over the past couple of decades. For many years, it wasn't understood as to what the cell of origin for uh, Hodgkin lymphoma was. Uh, some elegant studies in the 1990s included micro dissecting off individual Reed Sternberg cells out of tissue specimens and analyzing them and identifying an immunoglobulin heavy chain gene re rearrangement that led to the understanding that Reed Sternberg cells are B cells um, that have uh, crippled immunoglobulin heavy chain, uh, immunoglobulin um, manufacturing capabilities. So these cells do not make immunoglobulin. And within, uh, you know, Hodgkin is really a disease that is very unique in that the tumor cells within the tissue are only about 1% of the cells. And these cells are surrounded by a network of non-malignant cells that as you can see, um, there's this complex interplay of cytokines and chemokines that lead to the growth and survival of the hodgkin reed sternberg cell. And with this understanding, some cell surface markers have been identified, including CD30, which is therapeutically important, as well as PDL1, uh, which uh, leads to uh, important targeting in terms of therapies.
So brentuximab vidotin uh, was introduced uh, and approved in 2012. This is an antibody drug conjugate, which delivers a microtubule inhibitor directly into the Reed-Sterberg cell via binding at CD30. This was really quite a dramatic waterfall plot uh, at the time. 75% uh, of patients respond with about a third of patients achieving a complete remission. And you can see here that a subset of patients, uh, and these were relapse refractory patients, appear to have uh, possibly uh, durable remissions. And here you can see there was even a population of patients here who did not undergo stem cell transplantation who'd, who appear to be in long-term disease control. And then most recently, the PD-1 inhibitors, uh, which you know are very important across many different cancers and have really changed the way we think about treating cancer. Well, Hodgkin lymphoma is really the poster child for targeting uh, PDL1 and PDL2 uh, because the Reed Sternberg cells uh, harbor um, alterations in chromosome 9P24 with very frequent copy gain and amplification. And when you look at uh, staining of the RS cells here, you can see very prominent staining of PDL1. Uh, 9P24 uh, encodes for PDL1 and PDL2, and this really is borne out by the response rates that we see in the relapse and refractory setting with pembrolizumab and nivolumab uh, achieving overall response rates of about 75%, though the complete remission rates are uh, about up to 30%. And as in other settings, uh, this is generally well tolerated, though grade three to four adverse uh, events can happen. Um, though the majority of patients do not need to come off therapy uh, due to toxicity. So honing in on early stage Hodgkin, I thought I would use a um, case to illustrate some points. This is a 22 year old woman with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma who presents with cervical adenopathy without constitutional symptoms, a very common presentation. Her CT scan shows bilateral neck length adenopathy measuring up to four centimeters. She has a biopsy that's excisional and it shows classic Hodgkin lymphoma with the appropriate immunophenotype. PET scan shows the disease is localized to above the diaphragm that Low one here is actually uh, um, above the diaphragm and uh, at the cardiophrenic sulcus. Uh, this patient has stage 2A disease. It's non-bulky. Her sedimentation rate is 22. So how do we approach a patient like this? So the key is to balance again. We really want to achieve long-term disease control, but at the same time, we need to balance the risk of late toxicity. And I think this is something I always try to keep in mind as I'm looking at a new young patient with Hodgkin lymphoma. We know that uh, the majority of patients are gonna do well and the risk of relapse is really within that first 10 years for the vast majority of patients and then plateaus. But over time, uh, we can see significant increasing risk of secondary malignancies and cardiac disease, uh, which do not appear to plateau. I will say this is data up through 2007. So many of these patients were treated long before the improvements in uh, radiotherapy techniques and field and dose. So what are those uh, radiation associated late effects? So secondary cancer is obviously the one we worry about the most. This has a long latency, um, not beginning to occur till uh, 10 years plus, uh, typically after the receipt of radiation, and is clearly related to the dose and the field of radiation. So the one we really worry about the most is breast cancer. And in patients who are under, women under 30 who are treated with uh, chest irradiation, the risk is extremely high. You know, as the breast tissue is developing, it is particularly susceptible to damage that can ultimately lead to breast cancer. Patients uh, who smoke uh, in particular have a significantly elevated increase of lung cancer, um, gastrointestinal cancers, particularly uh, esophageal in the field of radiation to the mediastinum can occur. Soft tissue sarcomas fortunately are very rare, but very uh, difficult to treat generally. Thyroid cancers can also uh, occur. The other major uh, concern is for cardiovascular disease uh, for patients who have uh, radiotherapy to the chest. And this can manifest as accelerated coronary disease. Valvular disease is very common and often not even apparent on uh, physical exam. Pericardial uh, constriction can happen uh, as can conduction abnormalities. 
So this is a very important study um, called the HD6 study that was done uh, in Canada, uh, was originated in Canada and uh, also included uh, patients in North America and was really groundbreaking and sort of set the stage for asking the question, can we treat patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma without radiotherapy? And these were patients with stage one and two A non-bulky Hodgkin lymphoma, and they were randomized to the standard of care at that time, which was subtotal nodal irradiation. Um, patients who had unfavorable disease, which was defined as older age, high sed rate, mixed cellularity or lymphocyte depletion, or more than four nodal sites of involvement, also received two cycles of ABVD. The experimental arm was um, ABVD alone, uh, given for two cycles. If patients had a complete remission, they got two additional cycles for four total. If they had a partial remission, they got a total of six. And the primary outcome was really very forward thinking. This was a 12 year year overall survival difference they were looking for. And if you can imagine designing a trial that has that uh, you know, as your primary outcome, it's, it's gonna take a very long time to uh, read out, but this is a very important outcome in patients who have very favorable overall survival in general. This study um, closed early um, because subtotal nodal irradiation uh, was shown to be no better than involved field radiotherapy during the, the, con the conduct of the trial. And uh, the study was underpowered and there've been, this was published in the New England Journal in 2012. And there were some criticisms in terms of some of the deaths from radiation, maybe not being directly related to radiation, but um, there were some very important lessons here. And you can see um, for patients who got radiation alone, um, they had a more favorable freedom from disease progression than ABDD. But when you look at the overall survival, there were more deaths in the radiation group. And I think this really led us to think, you know, we really need to think more long term as we treat these patients and consider, can we use ABDD alone? So then uh, PET scanning came along, and this was really uh, an important advance in the field. And there were a number of studies that showed getting a PET scan after two cycles of therapy in retrospective studies where patients were treated with the planned therapy. In this case, in this particular study, it was ABVD plus radiotherapy in early stage patients. And you can see for uh, those patients, 85% of whom had a negative PET scan, the um, overall outcomes were really significantly more favorable than those who had a negative, uh, sorry, those who had a positive PET scan in the green curve here. So I'll just put this up uh, for reference um, that there are, uh, you know, we think about how to assess a PET scan looking at either the Doval or now it's called the five point score. And this uh, relates to the uptake in the nodal tissue that's involved compared to background uh, in order to give a score. So we would consider a negative PET scan to have obviously no uptake or uptake that's less than or equal to the mediastinum. And uh, there's no controversy there. Doville 3, um, it depends on the study. Some consider it to be negative, some consider it to be positive. Uh, if the uptake is greater than mediastinum but less than or equal to liver, um, Doville 4 and 5 are always considered to be positive. So this study, the EORTC H10 study was an important study uh, that was done in Europe to test the notion, can we use an early negative PET scan to deescalate therapy in patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma and omit radiation? So this took patients and divided them according to the following risk factors, bulky mediastinal disease, age over 50, sedimentation rate and B symptoms and more than three nodal groups. So favorable patients, the standard of care was uh, two, was three cycles of ABVD followed by radiotherapy. Uh, and that was regardless of the results of the PET scan. Uh, in the experimental arm, patients who were PET negative got four cycles of ABVD alone. Those who were PET positive were escalated to be a cop and radiotherapy. The unfavorable patients got four cycles of ABVD um, plus radiation as standard uh, and received six cycles in the experimental arm if they were PET negative and two cycles of be a cop and radiation. 
And what was seen in this study was there was about a 9% difference in progression-free survival uh, between chemotherapy only and chemo plus radiation in the favorable group. Interestingly, in the unfavorable group, which got more chemotherapy, six cycles of ABVD, the difference was much smaller at only 2%. This study considered a positive PET uh, to be um, Dovil 3 through 5. And the PET positive patients, they found that giving escalated BACOP plus radiotherapy did improve outcomes compared to continuing on with ABVD. So the, this study was felt to uh, be a negative study in terms of using uh, ABVD alone, but I think it all depends on how you look at it. Um, there have been a couple of other studies uh, that have looked at using a PET to omit radiation. This was the RAPID study, which took patients um, with stage 1 and 2A, had a PET scan after three cycles. If they were uh, negative, DOVA 1 and 2, they were randomized to observation or radiotherapy. And in this um, analysis here, you can see that there was a significant difference between radiotherapy and no further treatment. The study on the right was the Alliance study. Uh, this took, this was not a randomized study. Uh, patients were treated in a PET directed fashion. They got two cycles of ABVD. If they were PET negative, uh, which was a Dovil one through three, they got a total of four cycles. If they were Dovil four or five, they were similarly to the H10 study, um, escalated to be a cop for four cycles, uh, sorry, they should say two cycles plus radiotherapy. And you can see here, the patients who were DOVA 1 and 2 did very well with a 94% three-year progression-free survival. Those who were DOVA 3 um, did a little less favorably, 77%, and the positive ones were about 67%. So here again is data to suggest that, yes, if you use combined modality therapy with chemo plus radiation, there's probably a somewhere between 5 to 10% improvement in progression-free survival, but none of these studies showed a benefit in overall survival. And if you use the PET to uh, select patients uh, who may do well, uh, this is a strategy that may be very appealing. Feeling. There were a couple of other studies. The Rathel study also um, asked the same question. Could you um, give chemotherapy only uh, after ABVD? And there were a number of patients in this study uh, who had bulky stage two disease. And you can see in those patients who were PET2 negative and got either um, six cycles of ABVD or two ABVD and two AVD. We'll talk about this study in a moment in the advanced stage. The three-year progression-free survival was 91%. And then in the Alliance, we did a similar study to the non-bulky study, but this was all bulky patients. And we found that for patients who were um, PET negative, there was a 93% progression-free survival at three years with six cycles of ABVD alone, uh, which really uh, I think is a good result. So personally, how do I manage early stage Hodgkin lymphoma and in AYA patients? And you know, this is a very difficult and controversial area because, as you can see, we have a lot of different options. And this is just the adult options. You know, the pediatric um, have very pediatricians have very good uh, chemotherapy. Um, regimens and very good data to support their approach. But in uh, from the adult side, I really try to prioritize the omission of radiotherapy in patients who are stage one and two A non-bulky. I'll use a PET stratified approach. If they're PET negative, I'll give ABVD alone for four cycles. If they're Dovil one or two, if they're Dovil three, I tend to give six cycles and drop the bleomycin after two. If they're PET positive, I tend not to escalate to BACOP because BACOP causes infertility and it's um, maybe stem cell toxic. I tend to give more cycles of AB, two more cycles of ABVD, reassess, and then those are the patients I would always include radiation. I have a similar approach approach in stage 2B, I, but I in 2Bs, I use six cycles of chemo. I, I don't typically give four cycles. And in bulky patients, again, uh, have a very similar approach and try to give chemotherapy alone if patients are PET2 negative. So moving on to um, uh, newer therapies. So brentuximab plus AVD has been studied in early and favorable Hodgkin's. This was a study recently uh, published from uh, the group at Memorial. And you can see here patients who were PET negative after four cycles of BV AVD were treated in far cohorts with decreasing doses of radiation. And you can see here in these four cohorts, there was no difference between outcome 
uh, with any of these arms, including the no radiotherapy arm. So this is again, another strategy to avoid using radiation. So what's next in our early stage patients? I think um, more investigation is needed using brentuximab and the PD-1 inhibitors. And we really need large randomized studies to show benefit in this group, which has a very favorable overall outcome. And we really need to keep in mind things like adverse events, late effects, quality of life, and financial toxicity. And I'm really happy to say that that this study is moving forward. Um, Pam Allen from Emory is involved in this as is Sharon Castellino, looking at um, taking patients with favorable and unfavorable early stage disease using a PET directed approach and then randomizing each arm. Those who are negative will get standard treatment with ABVD. They're two, either a total of four or six cycles depending on favorable or unfavorable. Um, they will be randomized to brentuximab plus a PD-1 inhibitor in the, in the um, PET positive. Uh, the, co the comparison is escalated via COP. So this study has been approved and written and hopefully will be um, starting to enroll soon. And I think this is the data we really need uh, in order to uh, move the field forward. So advanced stage disease, uh, here's a case, a 29-year-old patient who had noted some neck adenopathy and had a scan and had disease above and below the diaphragm. The biopsy showed Hodgkin. He had um, you know, significant extranodal sites of disease and bony sites and in the lung. He, his international prognostic score was a two for male in stage four disease. So escalated via cup, I mentioned uh, the, the German uh, regimen, very aggressive. And you can see there have been a number of studies comparing it to ABVD. And what appears to be very clear is that it is associated with improved progression-free survival, probably on the order of at least 10%, but no difference in overall survival. And again, we've talked about the toxicity. So again, this is the Raffle study, and this, this asks the question in PET negative patients, could we drop bleomycin uh, to avoid the risk of bleomycin lung toxicity and compare that to ABVD? And this, um, this was a positive study suggesting that this is a strategy that we can use in patients who are PET positive. <laughs> excuse me, they were treated with two different BACOP regimens, uh, and the outcomes here look similar to uh, what we might expect. You can see um, this did include unfavorable early stage patients and the outcomes for the PET negative patients overall was about 85%. And uh, this did appear to correlate strongly with stage. So in Europe, I think this is a very interesting study. This is not an approach that we typically use in the US, but can we start with escalated BACOP and try to minimize the number of cycles? by getting a PET scan and if patients are negative after um, two cycles and four cycles to complete out ABVD as opposed to continue on with escalated BACOP. And you can see here, this strategy looked very good and was compared to a standard uh, regimen of giving six cycles of escalated BACOP. Despite these really good um, results, I think most of us in the US don't use escalated BACOP. It is a difficult to use regimen with a lot of myelotoxicity. So then the um, uh, Echelon 1 study was devised. Uh, this compared ABVD for six cycles versus brentuximab plus ABD for six cycles in patients with advanced stage classic Hodgkin lymphoma. This is the uh, five-year outcome. There's about a 7% difference in progression-free survival. Um, this, this has been a slightly controversial study. It's much more expensive. It's associated with more toxicity. And there wasn't an overall, overall survival benefit until a few days ago. Uh, and this is how we get our information these days through a press release, but this came from uh, Seattle Genetics and showed that uh, with six years of follow-up, there is now a difference in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.59. Um, so this was uh, interesting data. If you look at the peripheral neuropathy, which is really the, the late effect that we think about with this regimen, uh, you can see that it's significantly worse in the patients with uh, who received the combination of brentuximab with vinblastine. Fortunately, the majority of these are low-grade, uh, uh, you know, grade one uh, peripheral neuropathy. But you know, this is something to consider. And fortunately, our AYA patients seem to recover better from this combination than do older patients. So I um, have taken, uh, adopted this regimen in my AYA patients with Hodgkin lymphoma because I'm really trying to cure them essentially. And I think even a 7% difference um, is meaningful and particularly now that we have an overall survival data. 
I also wanted to point out this study um, from your very own Pam Allen. Uh, this is a very interesting study. It was a single arm study of about 30 patients um, with uh, early unfavorable and advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma who were treated with uh, monotherapy with pembrolizumab for three cycles and then four to six cycles of AVD. And you can see uh, the response rates are outstanding and you know it really doesn't get better than this progression-free survival curve. So this is very, uh, very interesting and thought provoking. And right now where we're at um, with advanced stage Hodgkin in this country is the large intergroup study comparing brentuximab plus AVD to nivolumab plus AVD. This study is actually accruing ahead of schedule and includes our pediatric colleagues, which is great. In Europe, they're comparing Biacop to a kinder, gentler Biacop with brentuximab, and we uh, await the results of, of these studies. Just a few words on relapse and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, 10 to 20% of patients uh, with early stage and up to 30% of advanced stage patients will relapse. Um, fortunately, a small number of primary refractory. And we do consider getting another biopsy just to make sure we're looking at Hodgkin lymphoma because patients with Hodgkin's can develop non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The standard of care in the US and around the world has in the second line setting and transplant eligible patients has really remained to use autologous stem cell transplant over many years. So if you look back at the data, it's really pretty thin. Uh, if you look at the number of patients, you know, it's 60 in one arm and 56 in the other arm. Um, and this looked at giving chemotherapy alone versus chemo with co consolidation with stem cell transplant. And you can see there was a benefit in freedom from treatment failure with stem cell transplant. So um, just wanted to point out this uh, abstract, which was presented at ASH this year, which I thought was very um, thought provoking and looked at various salvage regimens. This is a large retrospective analysis. And you can see in the top two lines, this one is brentuximab plus nivolumab. This one is um, a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, alone. And you can see that with uh, incorporation of checkpoint inhibitor prior to autologous stem cell transplant, we're seeing really significant improvements. The other thing I would say is we've known that complete remissions prior to going into transplant translate into better, um, better outcomes. In addition, brentuximab maintenance has been examined. And they're really, uh, these were patients who didn't get brentuximab upfront, but there's about a 20% difference in progression-free survival. So I suspect with longer follow-up, there may be an overall survival benefit. These are high-risk patients, those who relapse early or primary refractory or have extranodal disease. So the question still hangs in the air, you know, does everybody need a stem cell transplant? And there is this pediatric and adolescent and young adult study looking at uh, favorable patients who had localized disease initially and had localized relapse and didn't have any high risk features. Could those patients be treated with brentuximab, nivolumab uh, and add bendamustine if they don't have a complete remission and treat with radiotherapy as opposed to transplant? This is an, you know, not a common patient population. So I believe this study has completed its accrual. So we'll look to see how that looks. So how do I manage patients who, uh, AYAs who have relapsed or refractory disease? I have now really begun to incorporate PD-1 inhibitors in salvage. I give brentuximab and um, brentuximab vidotin if they have not had it before. If patients relapse late, I think standard chemotherapy is an option. Um, I still do consolidate everyone with a stem cell transplant because when they relapse, my goal here is to really try to achieve long-term disease control. I do incorporate radiation if patients have had a localized recurrence, particularly if they were localized to begin with and would give brentuximab maintenance as many cycles as tolerated for up to a year. So moving on to primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma, this was a patient of mine who um, was a nurse uh, at our hospital and uh, begged to get a chest x-ray after she had a persistent cough because she thought maybe she had TB. She'd been exposed to someone in the hospital and you know, called in a panic when her CT scan showed this enormous mass, uh, which was seen on PET scan. Her white count was elevated and her LDH was high. So this is a very interesting disease. You know, histologically, you see these large cells, um, some of which look a bit like reed sternberg cells, so there are a lot of them. And uh, they have a very particular immunohistochemical pattern. They express CD20. Um, they typically are weak for CD30. They express CD23. 
And over time, um, you know, we used to lump this disease in with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but a number of investigators in looking at gene expression profiling actually found that primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma shared a lot of characteristics uh, with Hodgkin lymphoma when you look at the gene expression patterns. So, and then there's a very rare disease called mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, which seems to be in between these two. So when you look back at RCHOP, um, you know, when prior to the days of uh, rituximab, um, you can see in this randomized study, this compared RCHOP to CHOP in younger patients, patients with primary mediastinal down here did quite poorly, but with the addition of rituximab, these patients did quite well. But most of these patients, because they typically present with bulky mediastinal disease, uh, received radiotherapy. And again, remember that this is a disease that is uh, you know, very, uh, almost always affects uh, AYAs. So dose suggested our EPOC is a infusional regimen developed at the NCI with the idea if you give continuous chemotherapy over four days, you will hit the tumor cells and get better kill if they're consistently exposed to chemo. And then you dose adjust to overcome differences in how patients metabolize the chemo. This study included 51 patients from the NCI and because the NCI can be criticized for having a healthier patient population who can get on a plane and travel to the NCI. They included a retrospective cohort from Stanford of 16 patients. And you can see with dose adjusted our EPOC, the outcomes were really um, exceptional, both at the NCI and Stanford. Um, this was a very interesting uh, real world analysis. You know, our sense is when you treat these patients, yes, the majority of them do very well with our EPOC, but there is a, you know, 10, up to 10% um, population who have very difficult to treat disease. And that was really borne out in this real world outcome. And interesting, you can see here that it appears that the younger patients may have a worse outcome uh, as we saw in the beginning in that epidemiologic data. Um, when you look at the PET scan at the end of treatment, you can see that um, some of these Doville 4s even do quite well, though the Doville 5s do poorly. And this is really, you know, it's just a caution when you're treating these patients. It is very common to see residual FDG avidity. And in Hodgkin, you would think this is clearly residual disease. But in PMBCL with our EPOC, this often resolves, which is what happened with my patient. So we know the biology, um, like with Hodgkin lymphoma, there is over, you know, uh, over expression of, of PDL1 and PDL2, um, and as well as some expression of CD30. Pembrolizumab was studied in this patient population and ultimately uh, FDA approved. This was updated at ASH this year, and you can see um, there does appear to be a, a group of patients who may have durable remissions um, uh, at about 33% at, at, um, at four years, um, and these are the overall survival numbers. When you add in brentuximab, brentuximab alone has very poor activity as a single agent in relapse PMBCL, you know, less than 15% response rate. But when you combine it with nivolumab, there may be um, some uh, advantage to that in terms of complete remissions. Though, again, this is a small single arm study and uh, it's hard to know uh, how this might compare to nivolumab alone. So this was um, a very uh, successful collaboration led by COG uh, to get this study off the ground. It took a long time to get it going, but this is currently open and enrolling study asking the question, can we incorporate nivolumab upfront in patients with primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma? It's a randomized uh, study um, comparing chemoimmunotherapy alone to uh, chemoimmunotherapy plus NEVO. So uh, hopefully you'll get this study open as will we, and we'll be able to answer this question and try to improve the outcome for these patients. CAR T cell, uh, as you know, is approved in uh, relapse and refractory uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and it's also been used in primary mediastinal. And this was uh, a recent paper from Blood Advances looking specifically at PMBCL patients. Um, you know, there are 33 patients that were in this multi-center retrospective analysis, and you can see the durable complete remission and progression-free survival looks to be maybe slightly higher than we would expect for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So this is a, a good uh, alternative in the relapse and refractory setting. 
So I wanted to spend uh, the last few minutes to talk about supportive care and survivorship issues, which are obviously um, extremely important in this patient population. So I liked this chart uh, from this review article really highlighting the need, need for multidisciplinary care. Um, you know, psychiatry, uh, Dr. Puri is extremely important in this patient population. I think we see a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, sort of post-traumatic stress type symptoms when these patients come back to see us. At initial diagnosis, fertility is extremely important. Fortunately, our therapies for lymphoma don't tend, at least our initial therapies don't tend to have a huge negative impact on fertility. But if patients relapse, we often try to get them to fertility preservation quickly. We always send male patients for sperm banking, even though they oftentimes will not need to do this. The psychosocial concerns, again, can't be overestimated. These are folks who are really pulled out of their normal lives just as they're beginning to establish their lives, and that can be extremely difficult. Financial counseling and assistance for those who are no longer on their patients, uh, I mean, on their parents' insurance plan or who are, you know, in underserved populations, this is critically important. Nutrition, you know, getting them connected with other people, it's incredibly isolating to be an AYA patient undergoing treatment. Um, so it really requires a multidisciplinary um, approach uh, with many team members being present. And then the survivorship issues and wanted to call out um, Sharon Castellino's work. This is a really nice review article a couple of years ago in British Journal of Hematology. So, you know, we know that we have to give some of these patients radiotherapy if their disease doesn't completely respond to chemotherapy alone. We know that some of them will need to be going to high dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue and all of these novel therapies, um, including check, you know, particularly checkpoint inhibitors. We know that they have these rare, but can be serious or life-threatening complications. And how do we think about those in our AYA patients? Is it any different? Um, and how do they recover from these side effects, the peripheral neuropathy I mentioned with brentuximab. So there are many different uh, components that we, we need to care, uh, to be very cognizant of after patients finish treatment. And on the bottom here, fatigue, financial hardship, quality of life, premature mortality, obviously these are all critical. And um, this has led to um, the NCCN having a specific AYA um, guideline. And these are the uh, survivorship expo um, recommendations. And you can see for patients who uh, did receive radiotherapy to the chest under the age of 30, generally we do uh, MRI and um, mammography. Um, or refer them to high-risk breast groups to talk about um, various prevention strategies. Again, fertility, although our therapies um, don't tend to cause uh, infertility when they're given upfront, the relapse setting is different. And we don't know as these patients you know, approach their mid or late 30s, if they haven't had families yet, is there an impact on, uh, is there some subtle impact on ovarian reserve and should we be sending these patients sooner to make sure that we don't miss that window? Cardiovascular screening is obviously very important. And we, uh, we're we fortunate uh, at Dana-Farber, as many places I think have a similar program. We have a cardio-oncologist who sees our patients and endocrinology. If we put patients into premature menopause, this is another important issue. So, um, you know, in terms of quality of life, I thought this was, a, was an interesting um, look at AYA lymphoma survivors. And you can see, interestingly, the global quality of life does not look that different from age-matched normative population. But when you look at all these individual domains like physical functioning and emotional functioning, cognitive and social functioning, these are significantly lower in our patients. And this is something that we uh, clearly see when we see these people in follow-up fatigue. And I think this fatigue can go on for a long time. And you know, I, I don't know what the mechanism of that fatigue is, but it, it is a real symptom. Insomnia is incredibly common in our patients. And you know, I think having a good sleep program is critical. We have a, a guy who is um, focusing on this and the, uh, doing intervention studies in this patient population is really important. The financial difficulties, huge. Um, anxiety, um, significantly higher. Interestingly, depression doesn't seem to be terribly different. And I think the other issue is this, this is a mobile patient population. So they get their treatment at one center, they need to be followed longitudinally. 
they're not seen in follow-up, they're not getting the appropriate, um, you know, survivorship screening. Uh, and we don't have a good way of tracking this. You know, the survivorship treatment plans were devised and those never really came to fruition. And I think this is, you know, following patients who, you know, are on clinical trials is a major issue um, as well. You know, how do we follow them for these very important long-term outcomes when they're no longer being seen at the primary treatment center? So uh, in summary, you know, lymphoma is a common malignancy in adolescent and young adults. Um, the short and long-term risks and benefits, you know, need to be discussed in great detail, particularly with the, regard to the use of radiotherapy. And I think the role of checkpoint inhibitors and other similar immunotherapy approaches uh, will continue to evolve and improve outcomes. And I didn't talk about CAR T cell therapy in Hodgkin, but that uh, is coming down the line and in clinical trials and may uh, end up being a, a viable uh, alternative for our relapse and refractory patients. And I can't um, overemphasize the need for ongoing collaboration between the uh, children's oncology group and the adult cooperative groups. I think this is, it's been really uh, fantastic to see this cooperation moving forward. And, um, you know, now we have shared protocols uh, in the advanced stage Hodgkin and in primary mediastinal, and hopefully soon we'll have our early stage um, study open. It takes a lot of negotiating. We're using adult regimens. The, the pediatricians have agreed to let us use ABVD as the standard, um, which is really outside of uh, what they typically do. And, and I think it's been really a great testament collaboration. Um, and we'll see whether incorporating these novel agents up front um, are going to be, you know, we're going to look at a lot of uh, endpoints, not only progression-free survival, but late effects, quality of life, financial toxicity, access to care. These are all obviously very key issues in treating uh, patients with AYA lymphomas. So um, I'd like to thank the our, our lymphoma group at Dana-Farber, which um, is, I think, like your group, uh, just an incredibly nice group of people that uh, I enjoy working with every day. And want to obviously thank the Puri family. It's just such an honor to be giving this um, talk uh, in honor of your uh, uh, husband and father. And also want to give a call out to uh, David Frank, who was at Dana Farber for many years and was really a, a huge mentor and supporter during my uh, career, particularly um, in my work as a program director. And he has had really unbelievable impact on uh, everybody at the Farber, and including all of our fellows and young faculty members. And then um, also want to give a shout out to uh, Christy, who's been a long-term friend and mentor and uh, just a phenomenal lymphoma doc. Um, your whole group is great. And I really hope we'll be able to um, collaborate moving forward. And it's been really fun to meet with people individually and hope I'll see everyone in person soon. So uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Anne, for a really amazing talk. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. So um, we'll have people, I'll kind of monitor the chat for you. Um, but if people want to raise their hands and unmute, they can do that too. Um, but as we're getting ready here, I have uh, kind of a quick question for you. It may be hard to answer. Um, so first of all, I want to commend you on the work that you've been doing to develop these Hodgkin's and PMBCL trials, both from the US intergroup uh, kind of uh, platform, but also collaborating with COG, as you alluded to, that's really hard to do. It's been really hard to get these off the ground. Yeah. And it's, it's really exciting to kind of see them now finally starting in, in both Hodgkin's and PMBCL. But my question for you is, I think something you brought up right there towards the end, um, it's curious to me that in ALL, we have really good data that the pediatric regimens are, are probably more effective in the young adult population than the adult regimens were, and they've actually switched protocols so that the AYA are now using those pediatric regimens. We don't really have any data like that in Hodgkin's, PMBCL, or even Burkitt's, right. and yet we've kind of adopted the adult strategy. So I'm wondering if you can kind of comment a little bit on that, and do you think we'll ever get that kind of data? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's uh, an interesting question, and there have been there is some data that suggests perhaps the pediatric regimens, which are more intensive, and you know the European regimen, which looks more like Biacop, maybe slightly better, but probably more toxic. Um, the you know one major difference between the two approaches is less anthracycline. I think, particularly in younger kids, there is a significant risk of um, anthracycline-related adverse effects late. 
Um, so I, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think the biology of the disease may be similar in the AYA group so that, um, you know, as opposed to um, ALL uh, in, the, in that, you know, AYA group, it seems to have very unique biology. Um, but, you know, I think in, in NHL, it's really interesting because the, the pediatricians use the same regimens for Burkitt and DLBCL, where we have very, very different approaches. And um, I think that's something that we really need to tackle together to figure out whether we need, you know, whether we may be under treating some of those patients or whether some of their young patients may be over treated by getting, you know, they get intrathecals, they get bilateral bone marrow biopsies and LPs, and it's, it's very intensive. And I think that's one thing that pediatricians have commented on that, you know, ABVD is going to be really well received by their patients mm -hmm. compared to, um, you know, they use ABV, EPC, with or with Eprintuximab, and those, they're coming in all the time. Um, so I think they're going to, it'll be interesting to see. Well, great, thank you. Um, so I'm looking, I haven't seen any questions yet in the chat. Does anybody have questions? Do they want to just unmute themselves and ask <coughs> in? Please speak up if I'm missing missing you. I may not see everybody here. Um, um, I'll ask a question if I could. So great yes, go ahead, Nan. Hodgkin's obviously has a specific translocation that leads to increased uh, PDL1. Why do you think primary mediastinal lymphoma is much more responsive to antibodies to PD1 than diffuse large B cell lymphoma? They also have alterations in 9P24. The same, the same. Yeah. Way. So they also get this overexpression of PDL1 and PDL2. Jonathan, I think, were you about to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, a, I guess, more of a comment and, and just I'm curious about Anne's take on it. So, um, you know, you so much of the data you presented was generated through the cooperative group. There were a few industry sponsored trials, but, uh, you know, certainly I think it highlights uh, the importance of, of, of the cooperative groups and, and especially in, in Hodgkin lymphoma. And I, I was just wondering if you could comment on that and, and, and sort of what your thoughts are, you know, moving forward about the cooperative groups and the importance, you know, for the, for those groups and, you know, in junior invest for the careers of junior investigators and, and so forth. Yeah, I think it's a, a great question. And I think the cooperative groups are doing these large, you know, really important that study in Hodgkin's, you know, should we be, should all early stage Hodgkin patients be getting these extremely expensive uh, therapies when the outcomes with ABVD, which costs, you know, less than $3,000 per six cycles, where BVAVD costs about 280,000 uh, for six cycles um, as paid by Medicare. You know, I think that's a, these are questions that industry is not going to be interested in. So, you know, I think we really need the cooperative groups to fill in. Industry is good at developing novel treatments and maybe doing some randomized studies, but the cooperative groups, I think, are still critical to uh, answering questions. Um, and I think they're a great opportunity for uh, junior investigators to get involved. I think all of the cooperative groups, I know I'm part of the Alliance Lymphoma Committee and um, John Leonard, who leads that committee, is incredibly supportive of junior faculty, and we have an open meeting. Anyone can pitch an idea. Um, you know, if you have an interest in something, he really is very inclusive, and I, I think that's what we really need to foster for our junior faculty uh, in order to help promote their careers. There's a question in the chat from Dr. Langston, and she wanted to know if you could comment on the role um, these days of allogeneic transplant for relapsed Hodgkin's. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I think there is a role. Um, you know, I, it's interesting because these patients often do well for a long time. And, you know, I've got a couple of people right now. I've got a patient I met when I was a first year attending who relapsed after his allo, uh, you know, in 2000 like eight, and he's still kind of limping along. So we can kind of keep these people going after allo or even after auto and the patients are waiting for CAR T and thinking that they don't need an allo. But, you know, I've seen patients do very well with allo. And I think particularly there's data that suggests if you get a checkpoint inhibitor prior to allo, that those that may have, may have a significant, um, positive benefit on, on progression-free survival, though can increase rates of GBH. So I think we 
need to keep ALO on the table um, because we don't know yet whether CAR T is going to result in a curative approach in patients who've relapsed after auto. Uh, so I think, and particularly as ALOs have gotten, you know, that field has really moved in a in a positive direction. I think over the past decade in terms of managing GVH and alternative donor sources, and so I think it's something we need to continue to think about. Is there anybody else with questions? Um, and you had mentioned uh, CAR T. Do you think CD30 is really the the right target for CAR T in Hodgkin's? The data hasn't been, I guess, quite as good as what we're seeing. You know, targeting CD20 in large cells. So, wondering about your thoughts of where we're going to go with CAR T. And yeah, I you know we've been waiting for that study to open, as you probably have too, for two years. Um, so the, you know, I think that the data that we have thus far, you know, at first there wasn't conditioning, you know, lymphodepleting chemo, and then the, the lymphodepletion strategies were um, probably um, not enough initially, and there were different doses of CAR T. So I think if you look at the patients who got appropriate lymphodepletion and got, you know, the higher doses of CARs, looks pretty good, but I, I think we don't know yet. I mean, I think CD30 makes sense as the target, but I don't know if it's going to, if alone it's going to be enough and, you know, or when it should uh, come into the algorithm. Uh, so I, I wish we could get those studies going because we have a lot of patients who are waiting for those. Yeah. Dr. Chang, you want to go ahead with your question? Sure. Uh, great, great talk. And I, this is more of a speculative question, but given you know, the long term effects of, uh, of uh, Hodgkin's therapy um, in the AYA, do you foresee a day where we will have an anthracycline free frontline therapy for the population? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. You know, I think chemotherapy works so well in this disease. When you have 90% of patients, you know, the overall survival numbers in AYA are, you know, above 90% at five years. Um, you know, I think that we have to be careful. And, you know, the, the risks of late effects from anthracycline, at least in the adult setting in these younger patients, seems to be relatively low, though I, I realize we have not studied it nearly as well as the, the pediatric folks. So I think some combination, I think, you know, there does seem to be some synergistic uh, effect of giving checkpoint inhibitors with chemo. You know, when we have patients are refractory to chemo and you give them checkpoint inhibitors and then they go to auto, they, it looks like they do very well. So I think we, uh, more to come on that, but it's a good question. All right, I think maybe one final question if there's anybody. If not, Dr. Pori and uh, the Pori family, do you guys want to um, take over the last part of the program here? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And I do want to thank Dr. Lucas for a wonderful presentation. Even I have understood some things. <laughs> um, and thank you so much. Now, what I like to do is as a tradition, we have presented a plaque to the speaker and thanking you and honoring you. And this is a plaque. And it, it is basically a picture also of Ganges and a bridge on Ganges, which, are, which is a cultural heritage. So oh. I hope you will appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, my, thank you. And my daughter, my brother, I can't find my son here, but <laughs> on behalf of all of you, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That looks wonderful. Thank you. And Barbara can mail it to you, I guess. Oh, yes, Excellent. I will. Great. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation and thanks as always to the Puri family for organizing this and allowing us to continue to do this year after year. Um, I think we'll conclude our program and everybody have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you, Dr. Blum. Thank you.